Hi, I'm Susan Sweater. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about melanoma guidelines at the 73rd American Academy of Dermatology meeting. And um, first, I'm going to start with the recommendations for biopsy of suspicious pigmented lesions. So both the American Academy of Dermatology clinical practice guidelines, as well as those from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, recommend a narrow margin excisional biopsy with about one to three millimeters of normal skin around a suspicious lesion. And this biopsy should be excisional if possible, and that can include an excisional punch biopsy, a deep shave or saucerization biopsy, or a fusiform or elliptical excision of the lesion. If one is going to perform the latter, the elliptical excision, it's often best to orient that on the extremities parallel to the underlying lymphatics, in other words, vertically, in case the patient is eligible for lymphatic mapping and senolipno biopsy staging. One other aspect about biopsy that's important is for the lentigo malignus subtype of melanoma in situ, in which case a broad shave biopsy may provide the most information for the pathologist in terms of microstaging. Now, what information should the pathologist give a clinician? The most important determinant of how patients do remains the Breslow thickness, and that's measured in millimeters under the microscope, followed by histologic ulceration, whether it's present or absent, and that should be a full thickness ulceration. And then mitotic index, which is measured as a number per millimeter squared. And it is preferable for the pathologist to note that exact or precise number per millimeter squared rather than just use a less than one or zero per millimeter squared compared to a one or more per millimeter squared, since we know that that mitotic number or mitotic index acts as an independent prognostic factor for how patients do across all tumor thicknesses. Generally, it's helpful for the pathologist to note whether the histologic margins are uh, clear on the excisional biopsy if that's performed or whether the tumor is transected at the deep or lateral margins. However, we don't recommend that histologic margin measurement be made in terms of number of millimeters as that tends to have no clinical relevance. Another factor that is important for the pathologist to note are the presence of intralymphatic metastasis under the microscope, and those are called microsatellites. The presence of those intralymphatic deposits actually upstages the patient to an N2C stage 3B melanoma at the outset, which often requires a very different treatment and long-going management approach. There are additional factors recommended by both the NCCN and AAD in terms of what is very helpful for the clinician to know, and these include the presence of angiolymphatic invasion, which is also called lymphovascular invasion. That histologic finding has been shown to correlate with sentinel node positivity, even in thin melanomas, as well as reduced disease-free survival. The histologic subtype of the melanoma can also be quite helpful, particularly for lentigo maligna, where we have some different treatment approaches in terms of surgical margins, the potential for stage dermose surgery, and even adjuvant therapy options. Desmoplastic melanoma often is associated with perineural invasion or neurotropism, and it's the one subtype of melanoma in which we may use local adjuvant radiation therapy following surgery. And so again, noting that histologic subtype and whether there's pure desmoplasia or mixed can be quite helpful. We're also recommending the use of some molecular tests in terms of comparative genomic hybridization and fluorescence in situ hybridization for histologically equivocal lesions. And there is excitement for the use of additional gene expression profiling tests, which are just recently coming to light and being published about in studies. The sentinel lymph node biopsy allows us the most accurate way to pathologically stage the regional lymph node basins. It is true at this point in time, since the advent of sentinel node biopsy over 20 years ago, that about 80% of the lymph node disease we see is comprised of microscopic lymph node positive disease, i.e. those patients who have sentinel node positivity. And this is very different than patients before the advent of sentinel node biopsy who presented with stage 3 disease that involved bulky lymphatic uh, metastasis in the regional nodes, which was much harder to surgically control given the size of the metastases. Both the AAD and NCCN melanoma guidelines recommend consideration and discussion of sentinel lymph node biopsy for melanomas that are greater than one millimeter, including all of those melanomas that are thick, greater than four millimeters in depth, as again, this helps us to most accurately stage the patient according to pathologic regional node status. There are instances of thin melanomas, less than or equal to one millimeter, in which sentinel lymph node biopsy staging may also be useful. And this is particularly true for those tumors that are between 0.76 and one millimeter in thickness with a high mitotic rate and or ulceration. 
those melanomas are actually T1B rather than T1A melanomas. The American Academy of Dermatology Clinical Practice Guidelines do not recommend sentinel lymph node biopsy for most T1A melanomas with rare exceptions, and particularly for tumors that are less than or equal to 0.75 millimeters in depth, regardless of the mitotic rate. This is also true in the NCCN guidelines. However, the NCCN guidelines consider the use of sentinel node biopsy for tumors that are greater than 0.75, in other words, 0.76 to 1 millimeters, as has been shown that the Breslow thickness above 0.75 millimeters is the most important predictor for sentinel node positivity in thin melanomas and not the mitotic rate. So what does this mean for most dermatologists? Since the rates of sentinel node positivity in thin tumors, those less than 0.75 millimeters, are only about 2 to 2.5 percent, we aren't recommending that those patients be referred for sentinel node biopsy unless there are extenuating factors. These can include strong patient preference for the procedure, which might result from a strong family history of melanoma. They can also result from a tumor that's incompletely microstaged, meaning that it's an incomplete biopsy where there is deep transection of the tumor and the precise Breslow thickness is not available. Other factors in the tumor, such as lymphovascular invasion, which I mentioned before, can correlate with sentinel node positivity, are also a consideration, as would be a very high mitotic rate and or young age. But in general, we're not recommending the procedure in most T1 melanomas. The surgical margins for cutaneous melanoma are based on randomized prospective controlled trials data for invasive disease. Unfortunately, that's not true for melanoma in situ, in which a 0.5 centimeter margin was, was recommended based on a 1992 NIH consensus conference on the diagnosis and treatment of early melanoma. A wider margin of up to one centimeter might be necessary for certain subtypes of melanoma, such as lentigo maligna, although histologic margin assessment in lentigo maligna is confounded by by the presence of sun-damaged melanocytes in fair skin individuals on the head, neck, and other sun-exposed areas where these types of melanomas occur. That's also called actinic melanocytic hyperplasia. For the invasive melanomas, the data again is based on randomized prospective trials and achieves a category one or level A rating in both the NCCN and AAD guidelines. For melanomas that are up to one millimeter in depth and including one millimeter, the T1 melanomas, the clinical margins recommended are a centimeter around the tumor. For those that measure up to two millimeters in depth or between one and two, a one to two centimeter margin is recommended. And for those melanomas that are two millimeters and greater in depth, a two centimeter clinical margin is the maximum margins recommended around the melanoma. It's important to note that these are clinical margins taken by the practitioner at the time of surgery and not histologic margins measured by the pathologist. What this means is that the clinically negative margins do not have to equate to the histologically negative margins. And in fact, we found a lot of confusion with additional, additional surgeries being performed for practitioners to try to achieve a histologic margin measurement when all of the trials are based on clinical margins. Lentigo maligna subtype of melanoma in situ might require a wider margin. In addition, both the NCCN and AAD recommend the value of peripheral margin assessment in this subtype, including the use of Mohs or staged excision. For the lentigo maligna subtype of melanoma, other non-surgical techniques have also been recognized for their value in controlling disease locally and providing somewhat of a field treatment, such as with the use of adjuvant amiquimod. The use of topical amiquimod remains off-label. It's not FDA approved due to the lack of randomized clinical trials data assessing its effectiveness in comparison with surgery or as an adjunct to surgery. However, there are a great deal of published data regarding its effectiveness in the, seri in the form of case reports and case series that suggest it may be particularly useful as an adjunct to surgery. The lentigo malignus subtype of melanoma may also be a problem in patients who are older and not able to undergo surgical excision, though that remains the optimal choice of therapy in this patient population. Mm -hmm.